Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. And we have a, a really interesting session ahead of us on this one. We are going to be looking at the world of biodynamics. So it's titled, as you can see up there, Biodynamics in Viticulture. But we will have to touch upon biodynamics in agriculture to understand how then it is applied to viticulture. Um, so it's something I've done a few masterclasses on within the wine school uh, network. So it's uh, it's a very interesting topic for me. It uh, it probably opens up many more questions than it does answers, but I'll do my best to structure this so you can understand it as much as possible. I will actually break it down into a, a number of sections. Uh, so this is our first part looking at the introduction to see where biodynamics will actually fit in terms of uh, other types of uh, agriculture and therefore viticulture. And then, of course, the history. We'll go through the history, how it started, uh, the influence, of course, of Rudolf Steiner, uh, also um, uh, Pfeiffer, as well as uh, and lots of other things around uh, the birth of organics and uh, and the birth of things like Demeter, uh, Biodivan, and all of those kind of organizations. Um, so if you do have any comments, questions, or concerns, please do get in touch via either commenting at the bottom of this video on YouTube, or you can get in touch via our social media, Wine with Jimmy and the other ones down at the bottom of the screen. So um, just a holding picture there in terms of uh, a vineyard with uh, some lovely pigs in it. I think I think there is a hen at the back left there as well. I think there's more pigs in the back, but you've got vines there, lots of lovely um, cover crops, which create a bit more biodiversity within the vineyard. Certainly one of the key buzzwords around biodynamics. But in order to understand biodynamics, let's talk about other types of um, viticulture, first of all, and that will lead up to what biodynamics is for us, because it's certainly at one end of the spectrum. And, and please, I am no um, you know, fervent expert farmer or anything like that. I have read a hell of a lot of literature on this to understand it as best as I can. I am, I like to think of myself as quite a centered person, but um, I don't think I'm as uh, astrological and so sort of uh, spiritual as some can be. So therefore, I will I will try and put a more kind of careful uh, sort of head on this, and, and I'll try and I keep it as understandable as possible. But of course, there are some quite grey areas to this approach. So first of all, just um, understanding at the other end of the spectrum for viticulture. And we're talking about what's called conventional. So if you have studied your WSET, you'll see this written as conventional viticulture or la viticulture conventionnelle, which is the, 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 French, um, the French format. So conventional, really, I've put, I've put a picture there. Uh, and this, for me, is the war button. OK, you press a big red button and you, you set off your nukes or you, you, you bomb the hell out of something. And for me, this is what conventional viticulture could be and sometimes is quite similar to. So this means if there is an issue in your vineyard, you uh, attack it. You don't think about it so much. You apply um, something like a chemical to it uh, to, 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 to really kill it. It's a bit like us. When we get ill, we, we, put, we apply ourselves full of lots of medicine. Uh, but in fact, it probably is there's a better ways to keep us from getting ill. Um, but we do need to treat it. So, so therefore, this is conventional. So any kind of issue, um, you will uh, try to counter it and you will apply any means necessary to actually create a crop. So as it says there, favoring a regular dependable harvest. So large multinational corporations within the wine industry that will need, uh, really they produce on numbers, they will need successful regular and consistent harvests. So this means, of course, they need to control many factors in the vineyard. Um, so this is really looking at a short term approach. An issue comes up, they attack that issue and they often don't think about the ramifications or really they probably do, but they don't really necessarily worry about those. What you'll often find is that vineyards become heavily dependent on all of the inputs that you are uh, 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 putting into that vineyard. Uh, and this means that the vines and all of the environment tends to become very reliant uh, 
on these chemicals, these pesticides, these fungicides, which are added really to counter these issues. Um, there tends to be little concern for the toxicity of the chemicals. Uh, we have found in certain parts of Europe that there's been excessively overuse of things like copper, and there's a lot of toxicity in certain vineyards in the Loire Valley, places like Bordeaux, where they often have to counter against mildew. Um, so this is what we would call conventional, going to war with the vineyard or with what's in the vineyard, the problems within the vineyard. So conventional viticulture, so the real opposite end of what we're going to be talking about mainly today. Um, next up would be the sustainable approach. So um, I quite like to think about all the steps we're going through and talking through on the next few slides. Conventional is kind of like smoking, you know, 20 a day uh, and really not giving too much concern about your health. Sustainable is you know that that smoking is bad for you, but you continue it, but you probably cut back a little bit. And then when we go through things like uh, um, integrated pest management and then organics, that's kind of like trying to wean yourself off smoking and maybe using nicotine patches. And then finally, biodynamics is kind of like, you know, going back to giving up smoking and then actually, uh, you know, looking at more holistic and homeopathic approaches to make yourself um, happier and more centered and so on. So sustainable, uh, la viticulture durable. This is uh, really looking at uh, a more long-term approach and thinking about what you are adding, your inputs you are adding into uh, into your vineyard. And I've mentioned on the one above, conventional, they, they have a lot of inputs. In fact, it ends up being very expensive because you are applying a huge amount of chemicals uh, and pesticides and fungicides that you have to purchase regular to really sort of counter the issues in the vineyard. Um, so the sustainable approach is that, well, if we step back from that, understand what's going wrong in the vineyard and think about a long-term approach and perhaps um, thinking about the uh, ecosystem, the ecology of the area, then maybe um, maybe there is actually sense in, uh, in promoting the local ecosystem, helping locally and thinking on a smaller scale to balance the economic effect as well. So you actually end up probably saving money. I mean, but it's a long-term approach. In the short term, of course, you may have to invest heavily in changing your processes, but sustainable, you still will apply um, things to counter issues, but you certainly think about the influences of those. So that is sustainable. Then we have things like uh, reasoned viticulture and reasoned intervention. Um, so this is where we tend to look at the positive side of viticulture and the positive impacts of viticulture uh, and reducing the negativity that surrounds uh, all of the issues uh, that you find within a vineyard. So it is about understanding in much greater detail than sustainability. Um, often it is linked within sustainability, which we had on the last slide, and it's about looking about uh, much greater detail in risk assessment at a real single specific level, a site specific level. Um, so it is, yeah, absolutely taking the ecosystem, the eco ecology in a step further, um, using pesticides only in, um, in the mindset of ecology, so understanding how what you input will affect the ecosystem and how that you uh, you are um, you are having a butterfly effect you are having a huge effect that goes on and on and on throughout if you keep using too much to eradicate certain issues um, so it's uh, another step within the sustainability um, IPM which is called integrated pest management uh, so this is now really starting to think in greater detail and only applying um, uh, issues around the e ecology and the ecosystem. So a rational application of biological, uh, biotechnical and chemical um, implications and really limiting the chemicals uh, to a minimum. So this is then, of course, um, really managing uh, and promoting the, uh, the food chain within your vineyard and thinking if there is an issue with a certain bug, then you'll have a bird that will be very much uh, your your key effect there at helping that out. And of course, that's in a greater step. So that's integrated pest management. Um, then we come on to organics. Now, importantly, biodynamics born organics uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And this is called la viticulture biologique. And we'll look at the symbols a little bit later that you may see on the label for this. 
Often a lot of people that pick up a bottle of French wine and see that it says biologique on it, they think it's immediately biodynamic, which is not correct. This is actually organic with the green label, the green stamp on it. Um, but uh, organic is really um, starting to control the practical side of the vineyard in terms of all of those synthetic products that may be used. Um, so, of course, eliminating things like glyphosate, which is that um, big brand of weed killer, and all of those kind of associated products. So synthetic products which are known with studies to actually affect and leach into soils, though companies like glyphosate will tell you that that is not true. But there has been uh, studies that have been done by this to counter that argument. Um, using raw materials, so the elements of the earth, things like copper, sulfur, and then also vegetable-based products as well. These are still permitted, but there certainly will be limits and the maximums, depending on the location in the world, and the world on these. So, there are um, more stringent limits, for example, in the United States of America on certain elements uh, where it's a bit more flexible in the European Union. Um, further promoting natural competition among species. Uh, so that's further taking IPM and uh, sustainable uh, and, uh, and uh, reasoned viticulture. And then, of course, there are a number of certification schemes across the world that uh, you can, if you follow these and, and you apply for these and you, you can prove that you are, um, you are farming in this way, you will gain that organic status, of course. So that is organic viticulture. And then there is ours, which, is, uh, which we're looking at, which is a biodynamy. So this is biodynamics. And really the guiding principles of biodynamics are, are yes, they can be mysterious and yes, they can be a little bit confusing. But if you look down at the real base level at the vineyard level or at the farm level the way to think about it is considering that the vineyard or farm is like an organism with many functional parts and it connects to the whole the wholeness of that uh, of that being so it's like saying that the, it's all connected so if you affect something in one part of the vineyard it's going to have a knock-on effect like it would do say uh, if you i don't know you you had a problem with your foot and you maybe had um, bruised your toe or you have issues with your feet with plantar fasciitis or something like that it affects your whole body you know your spine has to correct itself against the um, the weight shift that you have because you'll be favoring one leg more than the other and so on so it's kind of seeing um, seeing it as an organism, okay? So seeing the whole thing as an orga organism, and then in fact is where organic, uh, the name comes from, which biodynamics really born. So we'll go through that as well. Um, it's also about respect. It's about treating the farm like you would like to treat yourself, I suppose, hopefully like you would like to treat yourself. Um, so with compassion, uh, with kindliness and with uh, with a real gentle nature and sort of treating it in, a, in an appropriate way, treating it almost as a friend or a family member, you know, really sort of to understand it and understand its wants and its needs. Um, so really that's kind of really trying to then mimic nature, um, how nature will work and then also bringing in the, what we often think is the more sort of uh, astronomical, astrological side of it, which is your um, your cosmos, the moon, uh, the sun, the planets, and so on, and how they will influence agriculture. We'll talk about that on a future session, but um, there are practical applications from things like the sun, the moon, the cosmos, etc. Um, and then there, of course, there are more spiritual sides of it as well. Uh, so I will I I'll try my best to outlay some of them later. The, the practical side of it, I can quite well. It's the spiritual side of it, which sometimes escapes me. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to bring into play. Um, but whether we believe that spirituality or not, we are in constant influence by the cosmos and by the sun and by the moon and by the planets. Uh, and there is a there is like a rhythm to nature uh, and really it's about aligning what we know and our intelligence with the farm's intelligence. And certainly these farms, these these vineyards have intelligence. They, they certainly do. Um, and it's mind blowing how really nature within the farm environment uh, and, and out as a whole 
interacts and how all of these micro um, fungal um, spores spread information, talk to each other, how trees react and plants and cover crops and animals. It's, it's quite amazing how Mother Nature uh, reacts. So it's understanding in that kind of a way. And really, if a farmer or a, you know, a, a grape grower wants to understand biodynamics or at least try to practice it, it's kind of like an awakening process for the farmer. It's, uh, it's an inner transformation um, and it's changing how they react and how they understand their farm on a local scale. Because, uh, I mean, there are things like climate change, which globally we have to work together, but on a, on a small scale, we can't change cl climate change on one person. It's not possible. It's a collective effort. But we can start really with the founding blocks. We can start to understand uh, what we do as an impact, you know, where we travel and how our carbon footprint is and so on. So it's a kind of about sort of accepting this inner change, but it's incremental steps. It's not something you could do immediately, um, but it will eventually uh, improve the farmer's mentality and it's under his, un his or her understanding of the farm, but also understanding the um, the, the the healthiness of the soils, the seeds, the plants, the biodiversity, and it all stra it starts with intention and want and desire to do this. Um, and don't get me wrong, now I am talking about the more practical side of it. There are some very far-fetched sides of biodynamy. And then there are also some fundamental issues from where it originated from, which we'll have a look at in a second. Um, there certainly are some things we do need to talk about, but you can apply a rational approach to biodynamic, which is what uh, we're looking at uh, at this. Um, now, I've gone from conventional to biodynamic. There is also something that is also mentioned, which is natural wines. A natural wine could be made conventionally sustainably, organically, or biodynamically. We do tend to find a lot of them being organic and biodynamics because it fits that same sort of bill. But natural wine doesn't necessarily have a legal definition. So it does apply to a number of different uh, methodologies that we've just gone through. Um, but na the natural approach is one, one that is kind of understanding everything we talked about with biodynamics, but of course, being a little bit more natural about your approach through the vineyard and into the winery. So a bit more of a laissez-faire approach in terms of uh, hands-on. Um, I suppose hands-on in the vineyard, because you uh, want to understand the vine as much as possible, but less hands-on in the winery. Uh, the wine should be able to make itself. But um, I wanted to just include that because of course, natural wine is heavily talked about. I'll do a, se a separate session on natural wine in the future. Um, so understanding biodynamics is understanding really about how it begun and uh, really with the increased industrialization in Europe and then in the greater world, this is how we understand where biodynamic began. So um, industrialization, so we're, we're talking about after the world wars, there was really a distinct lack of um, able bodies to work in the land. Many people had been killed across Europe, of course many men had lost, sadly lost their lives in the Great Wars. So industrialization was a way of reducing the amount of labor on a grander scale because of the machinery available. Um, so all of those very famous aristocracy that had lots of land across Europe um, decimated from uh, the wars and they had also lost most of their men who would work the land um, they turned quickly to industrialization in order to continue to create a crop, in order to continue to produce and live and survive. So industrialization really started to take full steam ahead to support their farms. There were some, though, that were worrying that this is not the positive way forward. Um, and it was mass production, lots of chemicals, of course, and it was scarring their landscape. Um, so we have a creator called Rudolf Steiner of Biodynami, Biodynamics. And this man uh, is an important character in our story. He was born in a time where there was lots of nationalism. Certainly his, his kind of height of his day was uh, around the First World War in Germany. Uh, and then also around uh, around the mid wars, so uh, until his death in 1925. Um, but he was a very talented uh, thinker. He was an Austrian polymath. Uh, he had a multitude of disciplines under his belt. 
and he was born in 1861 uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He actually was born in today what we would say Slovenia is. And he was the son of a railway station master, um, so born in 1861. Now, he became very um, much an academic. Uh, he went to Vienna to study in 1879. Uh, so he was a, a late teenager at that time. Uh, and he worked very much on the works of Goethe uh, in 1882, adapting and extending his works, uh, works around the feeling and perception in comparison to being more objective and direct. So understanding more philosophical sort of uh, base behind it. Um, the first works that he had published was the works called The Philosophy of Freedom. He gained his PhD in 1891. Um, his first works were 1894, uh, his seminal work, uh, Philosophy of Freedom, and he moved to Berlin, so into Germany. And of course, a big rising sentiment in Germany at that time. By 1900, he was tutoring uh, and he had created the Waldorf Society, uh, which today still exists across the world. Um, so that is Rudolf Steiner's Waldorf Society. You can find it in the United Kingdom, United States and many places around the world uh, and is based around that kind of freedom of thinking and things like being out in the elements and, of course, uh, agriculture biodynamics and things like that as well. Uh, so he was in the in Germany at this point. Um, and then eventually, uh, by the um, the sort of early, well, just before the First World War, he founded the um, Anthroposophy movement and the society in 1913, as it states uh, just there. Um, and really, uh, this is the the movement that started to sort of bore things like uh, biodynamics, which we'll talk about. But um, he tutored more um, at the end of the First World War um, on a more practical level to sort of balance the kind of astronomical thinking that he was uh, he was going through. And that was through anthroposophy. Um, he is well, he was considered as, as kind of a mystic, uh, although that's not technically um, too correct. Uh, but also a scientist. So you must remember that he had sort of westernized scientific thinking and then more philosophical Eastern thought. And that's kind of what met. And that's what he's, you know, worked on with things like Goethe's works, like philosophy of freedom and then anthroposophy as well. Um, really all around going deeper in oneself, uh, but also at the same time scientifically assessing. So biodynamics is a mixture of this background of his. It's a mixture of practical agriculture and the effects of science within that. Um, there are many that believe it's more pseudoscience, uh, you know, and they don't believe in those effects, but there has been publications that prove it. There have been publications that disprove it, and that's pretty much across the world with many things today. But also that's uh, also that kind of more astronomical side of it, believing that the world is connected to the cosmos and the moons and the sun, the planets, and how that impacts everything as well in terms of us, our thoughts, our thinking, and also how it structures the world as we know it. And we'll go through that a little bit. And that's what I wanted to mention here. I wanted to just give you a little bit on anthroposophy now, I am very fascinated by biodynamic agriculture and how it's implied uh, and how it's used within viticulture. Um, it's a part of many works of Rudolf Steiner, really stemming from a center which was called anthroposophy, this, uh, this sort of freedom of thinking, this movement that he created, the society he created at the start of the 20th century. Anthroposophy has some real positive points to it, but it does have some very interesting and difficult to talk about negative points to it, certainly in today's thought process, which of course is around things like uh, um, uh, cultural appropriation and, and problems with, uh, with um, uh, ethics and, and race and racism. And unfortunately with anthroposophy, which is something I do really struggle with, there, uh, there were issues around there. Um, within anthroposophy, Steiner wrote that um, you know, vaccinations were very much against his, his uh, thought and process. So he's an anti-vaxxer. 
Um, also, with the race side of things, he did believe that um, black people were below white people. He wrote about this. Um, the African continent was a subcontinent. And unfortunately, that's something which is quite difficult to shake off. It was definitely a part of its time. I'm not giving excuses for it, but the, the rise of kind of nationalism within Central Europe at this time um, could probably see to sort of fuel that fire. So we must always think about when we talk about biodynamics, we need to ground ourselves and think about everything. And if you are very interested in biodynamics, it's interesting to really to talk about the practical and how, it, how the approach of it um, can benefit a vineyard, not necessarily what it is founded on originally. And, and we're not trying, I'm not trying to discredit it. Um, I'm trying to give you both sides of the argument because there are issues, of course, with many things in the world that stem from hundreds of years ago, from from many kind of empirical um, ideas, you know, that are, which are seated in things like racism and the slave trade and things like that. So um, that I wanted to give you that little bit of information. Um, but uh, yes, uh, his one of his fam famous phrases was saying that Caucasians, white people were distinguished by an intellectual life and then black people were distinguished by an instinct instinctual life uh, and that is uh, something which is quite difficult to shake so it's interesting reading that if you can about anthroposophy something that i really do struggle with um, but let's go back to viticulture and how biodynamics was applied to agriculture for then to be applied to viticulture. So Rudolf Steiner was, um, he gave eight lectures over a period of 10 days uh, in 1924 in Silesia. Okay, uh, so this was around a year only before his death. It was in a place called Kobowitz in Silesia, and that's today in Poland. Um, and at this point, because of his uh, lectures across Europe and his fame at this time, and certainly uh, because of the rise of industrialism with agriculture, he was actually very much in demand. He was a very busy man, um, and his health was actually failing at that time. Uh, it took uh, a, a gentleman called the Count Karl Kaiserlink, and uh, this uh, this man um, persuaded him to come to uh, his farms. Well, he actually managed 18 farms uh, and with a number of other farmers to instigate more practical, down to earth approaches because of the rise of industrialization. Uh, so he was persuaded in the end. And of course, he came and gave these um, these lectures. OK, so it was created to combat the growth of industrial agriculture. Um, and that's things like uh, the ready availability of cheap fertilizer at that time uh, and yeah, all those kind of um, mechanizations and things like that, which were heavily com uh, influencing the agricultural scene. Steiner committed to these dates and he gave these um, series of lectures, which you can purchase as a book. You can find it on YouTube, uh, a reading on YouTube as well. There's a lot of information out there uh, about the whole approaches to biodynamics. Now, I want, I want to mention, I'm going to talk um, over the next few parts of these series about the influences of biodynamics. I will also talk about the negatives and the positives. I will give you both sides of the approach of it um, because I think it's very important for you to understand that. Now, let's have a look at a few other things that Rudolf Steiner also predicted. So Rudolf Steiner predicted uh, BSE or mad cow's disease or foot and mouth, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and he was concerned that um, uh, things like uh, dead animal waste and, and animal meat and cow meat was being fed to cows. He predicted that feeding meat to a cow would cause the uric acid to go to the brain of the animal, causing madness. And yes, it did. Remember, we had outbreaks uh, across the world. Um, in Demeter certified cows, that's biodynamically certified cows and cow farms, there have been no re records uh, of um, of uh, BSE within Demeter certified cows, which of course you cannot practice uh, feeding of meat to those. So that's interesting, it was predicted uh, by him and uh, it has certainly had some worth behind it today. So Rudolf Steiner passed away in 1925, so the year after those lectures. Um, so we have those founding blocks, but Rudolf Steiner was very clear that this was a first creation of these which had come out of a very sort of 
complex mind of his, which was influenced by Eastern philosophy and Western science. And it, he was stated repeatedly that these things would need to be trialed and would need to be tested. But he passed away, people took these, and it has kind of morphed into some very hard, fast biodynamic viticulturalists who just completely deal with Steiner's processes where really he wanted to adapt them if he was to live longer. One man who took the baton on and carried on Steiner's work was Einfred Pfeiffer. He continued that work um, and uh, he um, really started to work on, on the, the immediate after effects you know, in uh, sort of 14, 15 years afterwards. Um, he released um, a book in 1938 uh, within Europe called Biodynamic Far Farming and Gardening, uh, which was based on those principles from Steiner. Um, now, note the time, 1938, of course, there was issues that happened around that time, and of course, the outbreak of war in 1939. He managed to escape to the US in 1940s and in fact carried on his work in the United States at that time. This is important because he was able then to actually publish his works across a wider audience at that time. Um, he was credited with taking his work to the public. Um, the real first kind of ambassadors for biodynamics were the doctors who could see scientifically the health benefits and also the women who adopted the approach as they inevitably were in charge of the produce of the household and they would witness the benefits of longer shelf life of things like vegetables and crops from biodynamic farms. Um, and today you often have many chefs clambering around for a better organic and biodynamic produce. Um, so the next thing to mention is that um, the catalyst for organics, which was born out of biodynamics. Pfeiffer's works were noticed by um, a lord, Lord Northbourne in the United Kingdom. He was a, a, a landholder and a very, um, a very sort of keen eye and interest for farming. Um, he was absolutely alarmed by the impact of modern agriculture on the environment, something which we have been very conscious about in recent times as well. Uh, and he invited Pfeiffer over to take part in a summer school and also a conference on biodynamic farming. Um, it was held at the property in July of 1939 and Northbourne, Lord Northbourne published a book called Look to the Land, which introduced the term organic for the first time. So here you have Steiner who passed away. Um, Pfeiffer takes up the reins and starts to promote biodynamic across Europe and eventually into the United States, but then introduces this biodynamic approach into the United Kingdom through Lord Northbourne. And then Lord Northbourne pr produces a book and starts to mention the terms organic for farming, which comes from organism within the biodynamic texture text. So this, um, this work kind of secularized biodynamic farming, took out some of the more kind of idiosyncratic and esoteric elements, which of course is the spiritual, uh, and focused on the practical. And that's what organics today really is. It's a much more watered down version of biodynamics and some would say more sensible and a more practical approach. Um, in 1943, Eve Balfour quoted Northbourne extensively and published a book called The Living Soils. So that's after his look to the land. And that actually led to the creation of what you'll see in the bottom right here, the Soil Association in 1946. And now we have a number of organic uh, um, certifications and businesses around the world. You'll see the US have the USDA, Europe's uh, bio, um, uh, bio uh, label there, the green one, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa as well. And they have limits on things like how much sulfur dioxide can be used at, at winemaking um, and um, you know, other things as well in terms of uh, in, in terms of the sort of limits and ramifications of copper and, and so on. Around uh, four and a half percent of the world's vineyards today are considered organic or biodynamic, and that's a few years ago. It's probably a little bit higher today. Uh, but you'll notice here the US forbid the use of sulfur dioxide in an organic wine. 
so that's used in the winery. But you can see that uh, Europe actually has um, 100 to 150 milligrams per litre for red to white, which is quite similar across most countries in the world, just very strict in the United States. Um, so therefore, we have the creation of organics, um, but biodynamics kind of fell by the wayside as this quite um, quite in-depth, in secular, esoteric and strange uh, approach because of the spiritual side that it, it implies. But there today have been organizations formed. We have Demeter here. It's a German-based organization that provides the certifications for agricultural produce uh, that follow biodynamics. So agriculture, not just viticulture. Um, they focus, one of their core principles is on the strength and life of the soil and therefore the produce. Uh, and um, Demeter comes from a tribute to the Greek goddess of grain and fertility, Demeter. Um, so to be certified, you'll have to use the biodynamic principles and the checklist really from Demeter for two years. Um, and you'll need to use the two field sprays, which we'll look at later, the 500, the 501, and the six preparations. Um, we think across, um, across the world, Demeter certified as about 620 wineries uh, that have that status. And it's about, it's about eight and a half thousand hectares, which uh, is not huge at all. Eight and a half thousand hectares is about, or well, let's say, yeah, it's about a tenth of the Rhone Valley in uh, in in France. So that is a, a very small percentage and small number indeed. Um, there's another organisation though, which is called Bio Divin. Um, the very um, loud and outspoken Michel Chapoutier expressed concerns with Demeter, basically saying it wasn't going strict enough with its limitations on things like use of uh, sulfur and copper and so on. It wasn't rigorous enough. Uh, and um, Chaputia uh, it created this rival organization, Bio Divan, who are certifying biodynamic uh, wine growers. Um, we're not sure on the numbers, um, but it is purely for viticulture. Whereas Demeter is agriculture, Bio Divan is, of course, just for viticulture, just for, for grape growing, therefore wine making. And then we have um, the calendar. So you can easily purchase the biodynamic uh, calendar, which is created by Maria Tun. Uh, she's a German um, farmer, agriculturalist and researcher and created a, a speeded up version of composting using things like calcium rich eggshells, basalt, nitrogen fixing capacity basalt uh, and, uh, and clays within the composting, but really also promoted this biodynamic calendar as well. So when you should be tending to your crops uh, and how you should be doing it and what you can apply in a more practical and a more modern way. It's basically adapting what was mentioned by Steiner, which was then adapted by Pfeiffer uh, and then adapted to a more kind of um, a holistic and homeopathic approach to gardens uh, and uh, to gardeners, but also farmers. So very important figure indeed. And then, of course, we're, we're going to be talking about this a lot across the whole of um, the next few parts for biodynamics, um, the evidence of success. Now, there are a number of publications that can be um, shown for evidence of success, but there's also publications where there are um, uh, contradictory evidence that biodynamics is not working as much as some people would think. Um, I mean, there is the Domain Romani Conti effect where you have um, their estate and they've, they've done lots of different uh, trials with organics versus biodynamics versus a bit more conventional. And they have seen that there hasn't been much difference between organics and biodynamics. Um, there has been an admission that uh, they haven't really focused on biodynamics on the full spiritual level, like you would expect with Rudolf Steiner's influence, but on a more practical level. And doing it in that half manner, or maybe a more practical manner for them, has not as worked as much as they had hoped. Um, but there was a paper that was um, published, this paper that you see in front of you here, in 1998 from the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences in Washington State Pullman University. Uh, and um, they shown that through their tests, they saw a significant effect on soil health uh, with higher temperatures uh, within, the, um, within the composting, faster maturation, higher nitrates, 
than conventional farms. This is across the world. They compared a number of these across the world, um, but their main focus, I think, was uh, in New Zealand, and the biodynamic seems to work in that instance in that area. But please remember, there are there's lots of contradictory evidence for this as well, um, and we'll talk through those as we have some. Um, uh, examples as we go through uh, future sessions. So that's the um, the end of our first part here. That's looking really at the introduction and the history of biodynamics. On part two, we'll look about um, the biodynamic vineyard itself, what needs to happen, um, what are the benefits of what these things are within the vineyard, but also the preparations of so the sprays and then the compost preparations we'll talk about as well on part two. Part three, we'll tackle some of the more um, uh, esoteric uh, astronomical side of things. Um, so that's one where we need to be a little bit more um, maybe mythical and spiritual. Mystical, I suppose, is the right word. But I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it's given you a bit of information about the background of biodynamics and organics, in fact. And thank you so much. So I've been Jimmy Smith of Wine with Jimmy, and we'll see you all very soon. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.